<clears throat> All right, we are back. I am going to blame that one on this record-breaking heat here in L.A. I swear you can't always depend on technology, especially when things are frying. All right, cool. So let me see if I can get him on now. That should work here. He's waiting to join, and I hope I can get my viewers back. And I'm sure that I will. If not, you guys will watch it. There you go. Can you hear me now? I can. I can absolutely hear you. What was that about? <laughs> I don't know because listen, I was listen. I was listening to uh, to Jim, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, poof. Well, I saw some messages from some other friends of mine. They said there was a video error pause, so I think it was an interconnection thing that was going on. Okay, gotcha. But nonetheless, what are you up to? Happy anniversary to you and Thomas. Thank you. Um, you know, listen, just living the the uh, the pandemic dream. The pandemic <laughs> dream. Let me yeah. tell my guest some little things about you. He is the professor, assistant professor of media studies at the University of Iowa. And there's a 2021 book that's slated to come out, Black Gayness and Black Gay Sitcoms. I'm excited about that. You have to come back to the soapbox and tell us about it. But right now, you're currently doing research that explores Black fandom with regards to Misty Copeland, Black Panther, The Wiz, and today's topic, The Golden Girls. Yay! <laughs> so I got a question. This is uncharted territory, this particular angle that you're approaching with the Golden Girls, even when I Google it, and I guess they're coming back on, yay, they're joining us. Even when I Googled it, there was hardly any sort of traction as to a galvanized Black response to the Golden Girls. So what are you finding? Like, what are the consistencies you're already finding in your early stages of research? Um, so, or, like, so there's, it's really very interesting because, um, you know, as Black folks, we are often um, very much concerned with um, representation and particularly self-representation. And so in so many ways, um, the ways that, uh, at least what I'm finding, the ways that Black fandom is galvanized is often around both um, sort of like political and sort of politics of respectability um, and also um, around a hunger for more kinds of like more representation but at the yeah. same time um and partly why i wanted to talk about golden girls in my book is that um you know so many times we talk about like black fandom and mm -hmm. black reception and black you know consumption around these ideas of like we need to do this thing because we need to show hollywood this or what have you um, mm -hmm. And there is, there's something that was very different about Golden Girls, where mm -hmm. um, I wanted to sort of take this, this thing that presumably Black folks don't necessarily pay attention to, or right. so I thought, um, and certainly something that with very few exceptions, um, we're not in Golden Girls. So I wanted yeah. to sort of parse out what, or if there was any, even anything there, because on one hand, I wasn't even sure that there were enough Black folks who could make up a research project who yeah. said they liked Golden Girls. So and part of it was actually just kind of an, an interesting thing. And then before I knew yeah. it, I was talking to 30 Black people. It's interesting because that's how I was introduced to Golden Girls in college. There was a common area, and we all watched soap operas and the Golden Girls in that era. And I remember as a kid, I would watch it, and I would pay attention to it. It struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't couldn't identify why. But when I got in college, I was like, oh, my God, these women are hilarious. Mm -hmm. So that's when it began for me when I was in school about around 18, 19, 20. When did it begin for you? Like, when did you realize, oh, my God, these women are touching my soul? Like, at what age were you? Um, so I was probably like, like, for real, for real, I was in undergrad um, watching oh, it wow. on Lifetime. Um, uh -huh. But... I also watched it, um, I'm, I, like Jim, am old enough to have watched it when it was um, on television, um, for real, for real, um, about on NBC's on, on, uh, on Saturday nights. And right. so um, really what it sort of um, comes down to in so many ways is that um, Golden Girls was that thing that uh, it came on Lifetime and mm -hmm. I would watch it like right before I went to sleep. And, um, and it just became sort of habitual. And um, my husband is a 
TV sleeper. So we had to oh, um, we had to figure out something that would work for <laughs> us. And Golden Girls, like in the old DVD or you the old the DVD, <laughs> right in the old DVD world, like the Golden Girls was the thing that um, that we could both agree like it was right. okay to have that on while we fell asleep. Yeah. So, and then this is getting to the meat of the conversation. Hard pivot here. Why is it and was it so easy for us to forgive the racial undertones that were throughout the show? You know, there were wink and nods to you, like different ways that they felt about or they saw in stereotypical ways that they saw black people. The one episode with the Caribbean maid, I believe, they said when she left the rock, mm -hmm. um, the infamous mixed blessings. Why was it so easy for us to just overlook those things or just, you know, brush over? Like, what, what was it about the show that made it easy for us to do that? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is that I think that genuinely the show um, and the writers, they always had their hearts in the right place. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they were always trying to do something that was interesting, that was perhaps um, groundbreaking, but what, and, but, and they might've been clumsy in their attempt, but yeah. the attempt never felt, um, the, ne the attempt never felt malicious. Yeah. And so I think that that was, that was part of it. And then actually, so my sort of half-baked theory about why Black folks um, even love Golden Girls is that, mm -hmm. um, so in TV, there's, you know, uh, particularly back in the 80s, linear TV was a thing. So we weren't like DVRing stuff and watching it later. And mm -hmm. so, um, but Golden Girls um, was really always, uh, or for most of its run, and particularly when it was super popular, it was actually paired with like black cast shows. So yeah. it was paired on Saturday night in its first year with Give Me a Break, The Facts of Life, 227. Right. Um, then it like it was with you know Amen and Two Two Seven and those yeah. kind of shows. So I feel like there was always something about Golden Girls that made it feel kind of like Inclusive. it spoke to us. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It, like it spoke to us in a way, yeah. even yeah. though it wasn't. It wasn't our demographic valid. wasn't reflected. Yeah, and yeah. my friend Ronnie Davis said that the uh, maid, uh, Caribbean maid, was Paula Kelly, who passed yeah. away not too. Yes, long. come on, Miss Paula Kelly. She was I amazing. know that there's an amazing is Paula Kelly. <laughs> yeah, there's an amazing video of her in um, mm -hmm. uh, in Sophisticated Ladies with yeah. Gregory Hines. I, I I can't remember if Gregory Hines is in or if he had already left. But yeah, uh -huh. yeah, she's amazing. Do you think it was a knee-jerk reaction when Hulu, Hulu pulled the episode Mixed Blessings? Um, Absolutely. You Absolutely. thought it was knee-jerk? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, was, it was a knee-jerk reaction because mm -hmm. partly what everybody was trying to do was be woke about things. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've sort of, um, sort of been working through with that whole thing is, you know, I don't think that that was ever a thing Black folks were concerned about. Yeah, and we so didn't there, think about it. Yeah. Right, and so, the, the, so there's a way in which um, the kind of knee-jerk reaction of places like Hulu um, yeah. sort of function to, to sort of like give folks something that we didn't even ask for. And then ultimately, right. like ultimately like, you know, white Golden Girls fans like look at us crazy and they're like, you know, why did y'all get that pulled? And we're like, we didn't want it pulled. Like, yeah, was it was something that was glossed over until I saw the news and the breaking news and all the different reactions to it. I was thinking, oh, I hadn't even considered that. I remember the joke and I remember what the joke referenced, but it wasn't something that I studied and harped on at the time. I just mm -hmm. went with the joke and laughed and got past it. So I do, uh, like you, I thought it was knee jerk. Yeah. Um, you know, Designing Women was on at the time, uh, maybe a year after the debut, Golden Girls debut. Do you find, you think that was more of a, a clone? Like, you know, when you find a model that works, you want to build as many shows in that template as possible, uh, in that, as, as you could possibly can, and, you know, expound on the success of that particular equation of a show. Do you think that was the response to having Designing Women, or do you just feel like it was a different show in its own volition? Um, so, I mean, I think that certainly there is a way that we can look at designing women um, mm -hmm. as a kind of 
clone of <clears throat> Golden Girls. However, yeah. I think that part of it is also that um, that CBS, um, CBS from the nineteen like in the nineteen seventies had been known to um, to pioneer what was called the turn to relevance in television, where television yeah. was dealing with race, class, gender, sexuality, etc. Mm -hmm. So CBS was home to All in the Family, to Maude, and mm -hmm. those kind of shows. And so, if we sort of move forward to the mid eighties and we think about designing women. Designing women is, um, I would argue, is much more political than the Golden Girls. The it's Golden much. Girls, to me, was a softer sell of politics. Right. Um, Designing Women and Murphy Brown, which was also on CBS, were, um, were super forceful in their politic. And mm -hmm. I would also argue that it's part of the reason that Designing Women and Murphy Brown don't necessarily feel as timeless as Golden right. Girls does. Yeah, they don't um, stand the test of time, those shows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I mean, you know, Lifetime also used to rerun uh, Designing Women and Murphy Brown. And yeah. I have, and I like, I worship at the altar of Candace Bergen. Um, yeah. <laughs> but like, but Murphy Brown is a relic of its time. And Golden Girls always, um, felt like not what it was, but what it would be. And the reason is, is because, and this is a great seg, and I'm glad you brought that up. I believe the issues that they tackled on Golden Girls are very present and real today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's easy to project what's going on, you know, with those women as opposed to what we're actually living. Speak to some of those social issues that immediately come to mind. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, they dealt with um, HIV AIDS, um, yeah. 72 hours, and um, I thought that episode was actually a really great episode in the sense that um, there is that great line that, um, that uh, Rue McClanahan slash Blanche says, which is essentially that, you know, AIDS is not God's punishment for, you know, for bad people. Yeah. Um, and for promiscuous people. And so I think that episode was really uh, nicely done. I think um, even the idea that we were thinking about, you know, committed gay relationships um, when we dealt with Clayton and good Lord, I'm a bad fan because I can't remember his um, his partner's name. This is Blanche's just, brother. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Clayton was Blanche's brother, but I can't remember his name. I can't think um, of his partner's name. Yeah, I can't yeah, think I of his name. I remember he was a cop. I do remember that much. Um, yeah. But anywho, um, but like even the idea of sort of dealing with, um, you know, with queer kinship and queer family um, yeah. networks. And so I think that um, I think that it actually did a ton of really fascinating and important work for the 1980s. And yeah. it always managed to make sure that it was funny. And they even talked about assisted suicide and whatever. So maybe oh, yes. uh -huh. be I mean, when I was going back and just doing my research for both you and Jim, I was thinking, oh, my God, these writers were so freaking ahead of their time. And yeah. the issues and the themes are so lasting. So I get it. I was renewed, you know, thinking, oh, my God, I want to watch more of the Golden Girls now because I'm one of those types. I'll binge watch it on a Saturday and I'll binge watch it the following Saturday. And then I'll fall off. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, this encouraged me to dive back into it because, like Jim said, we're longing for some, for some comfort right now, for some nostalgia, for some things that take us to a place to where we just felt better about being on this earth. And the Golden Girls do that. Do you think if it was launched today with a few little fixes, because a lot of things you'd have to update to make it appeal mm -hmm. to the modern day audience, do you think it would work if it was launched today? Four old women living together, same premise, same type of characters. Do you think it would work? Well, so I mean, so I think work is work is interesting, sort of in a contemporary moment because um, you know success uh, success for television is so vastly different than what yeah. it was in the eighties. Um, I also think that it would be difficult to catch that kind of lightning in a bottle, just yeah. the same ways that, um, you know, Black television in particular continue trying to sort of chase the, you know, chase that Cosby show high and yeah. could never get it back. I don't know that we could get Golden Girls back in that way because I think there was, 
there was something really, really unique about yeah. the fact that that was a show. And when we have those kind of ensemble shows, it's so uh, frequent that we will say things like, oh, like so-and-so was the, you know, was the weakest link. Mm -hmm. The fact is, is that there was like, there was not a, a weak link on that show. Yeah. And I don't think that A, I don't think that any network would actually pay the actresses what they, or those kinds of actresses who would work in the roles, yeah. um, the money to actually be able to do, you know, to do it and to make it work. And I honestly, for me, I I would simply just be like, you know what, listen, I don't want the Golden Girls Redux. I just, I'll just like go watch the reruns. Yeah, totally. I feel like that show should ever stay off the reboot list. You know, there's this whole reboot sensation going on. And that is one show that you should never see on a short list, on any list at all, mm -hmm. because it still lives today in its present form. Yeah. I totally agree. Dr. Alfred Martin, I need a favor from you. When the book is ready, when the book is released in 2021, you'll come back and talk about it, right? Absolutely. And when this book that you're currently researching comes out, you'll come back and talk about that one too, yes? I will, I will do that as well. And I will hopefully work out some of these technical glitches, though I don't think that one was my fault. But however, it's what it is. It's really hot now late today, so I'm just going to blame it on the weather. Well, try, try not to melt. <laughs> Happy anniversary to you and Thomas. Both you and Thomas, Jim and Frank are celebrating these unions and my behind is just as single as ever. You write a book about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, friend. I really appreciate you. It was a joy sitting down on this hot Sunday afternoon and, ha and having you hop on the soapbox. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. You have a good, good afternoon and a good night. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. All right, folks. So that was it. We have, I mean, we didn't even begin to cover uh a slither of everything that I wanted to get into. There's just so much to dive into when talking about those women, Dorothy Blanche, Sophia, Betty. I mean, they just, the rose, they just give it to us in time and time again. Even when I watch the shows, I always pick up on something that I didn't catch. And I've seen several episodes several times. And it's like, oh, I didn't get that. So, uh, yeah, I'm just renewed. Just wanted to give you guys something different to consider. Didn't want to be heavily political today because... I can pretty much drive that engine too, but you know, I just want to give us something to just escape with. And the Golden Girls are always, always a wonderful group to distract you and take our minds off this present crazy world that we live in. Thank you so much for joining me, Jermaine Taylor on the Soapbox. Like I said, folks, do send me questions, send me ideas, send me things that I can improve on. I can be reached on Twitter at TaylorMade World, Instagram at TaylorMade World, and you can also DM me on my Facebook Messenger app at Jermaine Taylor. Thank you again, and I always appreciate you guys for stopping by and hopping on the soapbox. Bye.